If you are seeing this video in your subscription feed at time of release, it means a new Vidoc for Destiny has just went live. I would highly suggest watching the Vidoc first and seeing all of the reveals for yourself before continuing to watch this video. If you have already watched the Vidoc, then feel free to keep watching. Hello everyone! Very recently, I was invited to Bungie's privately set up Discord server to get a small preview of the Witch Queen, including an early watch of the Vidoc, which is mainly what we're going to be chatting about today, in addition to getting to see a story mission in action, along with some patrolling around the Throne World destination, and a look at crafting. Now, just to set some expectations, I'm not going to be talking about any narrative elements of the campaign that is for you and me to explore on the day of the expansion. I am not here to ruin anything related to the story, partly because I don't want to, partly because I don't have a million dollars to give Bungie if I do, but mostly because I don't want to. And in case it's not obvious, spoilers for Witch Queen related content and season 16 ahead. Now what I can say, and what Bungie says in the Vidoc, is that Bungie is really focused on a much better campaign experience than we typically get within an expansion. Historically, this is not an area that I think Bungie has been super strong about. The narrative portion has definitely been getting better, but the gameplay elements have been pretty much the same. Bungie is looking to step that up. Quote, probably the most ambitious campaign we've made, end quote. Then a new quote, building the definitive Destiny campaign. So leaning into the journey you can find in exotic missions or the mechanics you might find in a dungeon, end quote. Missions are apparently also going to be a bit longer than what we are used to. Now, is that to say that you should expect the campaign to be much more difficult as a result? I don't think so, but it should be, at the very least, more interesting or give some more memorable moments. That being said, you can make the campaign more difficult with the legendary difficulty, not to mention properly scaling enemy density and or difficulty with the amount of players in your team. Previously, if you played in a group of three, the campaign was even more of a joke than it usually is in terms of difficulty because you just absolutely maul your way through it. Now, Bungie is actually scaling it to how many people are in your team to make it so you don't completely roll over the campaign, even though you still probably will on normal mode. Not only that, but legendary mode will change some of the enemies that you fight, most often replacing weaker or lower health enemies with stronger ones or swapping in more Lucent Brood, AKA the Light Powered Hive. Fun fact, when an enemy casts a super, the game will say in the kill feed that they popped a super like you were playing PVP. You'll be able to play the legendary difficulty on day one. There is no grind needed to start playing the campaign on legendary. I was told that it is very possible to solo your way through Legendary Difficulty. It is not just a thing for fire teams, and I would imagine more experienced, above average players are probably not going to struggle too much with the solo experience, but it might not be a walk in the park either for those who aren't familiar with that kind of combat difficulty. It's probably not going to be like soloing a GM or soloing a dungeon or anything like that, but it's definitely a couple of clicks up compared to what you might be used to. I would recommend playing on Legendary if you're a pretty active player with good thumb skill, because playing on Legendary will also help speed up the level grind by giving double drops during major encounters within the campaign. Major encounters are marked with a place to drop a rally banner, and most missions will have three major encounters within them, although the mission we got to watch only had one because it was the shortest mission in the campaign. So, you're also going to be getting more drops during the campaign, instead of just at the end of missions, if you even got something at the end of a mission in the past. Playing on Legendary will make the grind to the soft cap go a bit faster, it seems, which is great. I don't want to spend a lot of time having to grind to the soft cap. But let's say you're getting your ass kicked by the Legendary mode, or maybe Normal mode is too boring. You can go to the other difficulty whenever you want. Well, I don't think you'd like swap it mid-mission or anything. You'd probably have to leave and come back, but you know, you get it. Oh, and you'll be able to boot up any of the campaign missions whenever you want via the main director menu. We also got a look at the deep sight mechanic, which is basically the new way that you're going to spawn in platforms in Savathun's throne world, akin to Taken King's ghost platforms or the Dreaming City's tincture platforms. In the mission we watched, it 
felt like it was planned out, sort of like a tutorial on the mechanic, but that is unlikely to be the case with every instance of using Deep Sight. Although, to activate Deep Sight, you have to walk up to a big glowing ball that's pretty hard to miss. So, I guess we'll see how they plan on keeping some of those a secret, if they plan to at all. I know it seems silly to invest so much time and effort on something that most people are probably just going to fly through or just play once or twice and never again. But I do really appreciate Bungie going the extra mile to make the campaign a more memorable or at least a more important part of the game on launch day. The campaign is also longer than Beyond Light's campaign was, so that's awesome. Speaking of story, Season 16. Season 16 is called Season of the Risen. While the main campaign will be happening within Savathun's throne world, the seasonal story arc will be happening outside of the throne world. We are going to link back up with Keitel, who has some light-suppressing technology that they were trying to use, and we'll be trying to use it to stop the Lucent Brood from doing Lucent Brood things. You know, little enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of a deal going on. That's really all we have from the Vidoc in terms of Season 16, and that's basically all we were given from the event. Moving on from story stuff, we're going to talk about the Glaive next. It's a melee weapon, a projectile weapon, and a shield. The projectile is a bit of a slower moving thing, it's not hit scan, so you are going to need some good tracking and leading skills in order to hit. Some information not in the Vidoc, in PvP, the projectile is not a one-shot, but it will leave an enemy pretty weak, to the point where I believe Bungie said you could hit with a projectile and then stab a person with a glaive for the kill. That being said, that info is based on the last time someone played a build of the game, which could have been out of date, so who really knows for certain, but I would be surprised if we saw a significant change there. And with regards to the shield, you actually need to deal damage to charge the shield up in order to use it. You're not just going to be able to whip out a glaive in the middle of a trials match, pretty sure that's illegal, pop your shield, and then go res someone or anything like that. It requires you to be active with the glaive to get any real use out of the shield. The glaive is the first weapon that you are going to craft, which will introduce weapon crafting in general, which we have talked about quite a lot already in a recent video. Some of the currencies needed for weapon crafting were teased during the event that I went to, including stuff for the Osteostriga Exotic SMG, which includes Resonant Alloy, Neutral Element, Ascendant Alloy, which is exotic quality, and Ruinous Element, which is legendary. Ascendant Alloy, I assume, being the Ascendant Shard of the crafting world. Ascendant Alloy will come from challenging activities to upgrade enhanced traits, aka perks. Oh yeah, there's enhanced traits, aka perks. We call them perks, traits, perks. I'm just gonna swap between them. We knew about enhanced traits from a recent TWAB, but not what they really meant. It turns out it's actually exactly what it says. For example, there's a new trait called Compulsive Reloader. Perfect perk for me, which gives you increased reload speed when your magazine is close to full. Enhancing this perk buffs the reload speed even more. Auto-loading holster was another one that I saw enhance that to shorten the timer between stowing and reloading. So it's like three seconds now, it might be, you know, 10% faster, 2.7 seconds, 2.5 seconds, whatever. There were a bunch of other perks that I saw, I think heating up, perpetual motion. There was another new perk in there that I forget what it was, but it sort of looked like a wellspring or surplus type perk in terms of the icon itself, so it probably has something to do with stat boosts or ability energy or something like that. I think I saw a Vorpal in there, maybe Adrenaline Junkie in there, moving target. So there's a lot of perks that can be enhanced. I, I would imagine it's probably all of them. The higher the level of your weapon, the more perk options you can unlock. I believe level 20 is where your benefits end, but you can continue to level the weapon just as a way of showing how much you've used it, and it will even show the day that you crafted it. Something very, very important to know about crafting, and I forget if I mentioned this in a previous video, is that weapons still have perk pools. When you extract a perk like Rampage out of a gun via Deep Sight Resonance, you will be able to then unlock Rampage as a perk on weapons that have Rampage in their perk pool. The weapon that I was talking about earlier 
I didn't see Rampage as a selectable perk, and there were six main perks per column. So you are still confined to the perk pool of a particular weapon when it comes to choosing perks. You're not going to be able to just throw anything onto anything. In terms of how long it'll take to go from level 1 to a completely maxed out, enhanced perks, everything, the whole 9 on a gun, it's a very difficult question to answer because of so many factors, but they're hoping it's short enough that it doesn't feel super grindy, but long enough where you do actually need to use the gun for a bit to fully unlock its potential. Also, I think I messed this up in the previous video, but I think I said that you could change the archetype of a weapon, like a rapid fire pulse into a high impact or something. I don't believe that is true. I mistaked the masterwork bonus 10 stat thing for the ability to swap archetypes. Uh, case in point as to why I do not do live video recordings, because I mess things up. Season 16 is going to have an origin trait called Land Tank, which was described as Rampage, but defensively, where you get increased resilience and damage resistance after final blows. If you watched the Weapons and Armor teaser, link that in the description, then all of the exotics mentioned in the Vidoc will be old news to you, but we're going to quickly cover them anyway. The Osteo Striga SMG fires homing projectiles that explode into a poison burst. We have the Worm Launcher called Parasite that was teased, firing a worm out of a grenade launcher. We have the Grand Overture Machine Gun, which I'm guessing is the seasonal weapon for Season 16, hence the Season Pass Required subtitle in the teaser video, which Bungie says is the Be the Colossus Gun, firing a ton of projectile missiles at targets, sort of how the Colossus does with those missiles that slow you. I would love to see the other semi-automatic gun that you see them use in, like, the GM Proving Grounds Nightfall. That thing would be awesome. Next, each class is going to have their own exotic glaive that seems like it will be crafted. Titans get one that places what looks like a mini Ward of Dawn on the ground. Warlocks get one that drops a healing turret, and Hunters get one that does a big chain lightning attack on the ground. There are two more exotic weapons that we don't know about just yet. I assume one of them being a raid exotic, and the other one, who really knows? In terms of exotic armor, we got to learn about both Warlock armor pieces and then one of each for the Titan and the Hunter. Again, that is both the Vidoc and the armor teaser videos. The Titan armor replaces your barricade with a wall of stasis, but still gives you the benefit of rally barricade with that little sort of slot in the middle of the wall there. That's going to be very good in a build that I discussed a few days ago. Hunters, the only one we know of right now, is one that I was not really that impressed by at all Blight Ranger Helmet, which increases the damage of reflected projectiles. Hunters killing people with their own super was pretty much already doing enough damage to be effective or get a kill, but I guess this will really seal the deal on killing someone with their own super or maybe rocket or something. That's where I see the utility of this ending as reflected PvE damage has historically been a complete non-factor in everything. Warlocks, we got to see your stasis and non-stasis exotics. Everyone's getting one stasis and one non-stasis exotic. Your stasis exotic is Osmiomancy Gloves, where you get another cold snap grenade with enhanced seeking. That's, you know, not too shabby as far as stasis goes. The other one is called Devouring Rift Legs, although I'm not sure that's the final name. That's just kind of what they mention in the Vidoc. These look pretty badass. What I found funny was, I guess, just the inspiration for the exotic perk. The issue is that Empowering Rift is just not as good as Healing Rift in endgame level content. You generally want to be alive more than you want to deal damage, and there's plenty of damage debuffs and buffs out there. And it seems like the perk is just Empowering Rift now heals you as well as giving you Empowering Rift. And I just found it funny that the way that they're trying to make Empowering Rift work in Endgame is to just make it Healing Rift. I mean, technically, it works. I don't know how much it's going to be used. It's, it seems good. But, I, yeah, I just, I just found that funny. I was like, how do we get people to use Empowering Rift? Oh, just make it Healing Rift also. <laughs> so... Anyway, uh, let's move on to one of the more unknown topics, and that is Void 3.0. This is 
the restructuring of the void subclasses into the style of what stasis is like. All classes will have their main abilities unlocked from the get-go, but I believe in the Q&A session that I had with Bungie, they said that unlocking the other abilities is not that difficult or time-consuming to do. I think it's just some material turn-ins at the tower or something very simple like that. Fragments and aspects, on the other hand, I am not as sure on that. We get some hover hand action over some of these aspects and fragments here. Echo of Exchange. Melee final blows give grenade energy. Remnants, your lingering grenade effects have increased duration. So that's Vortex, Void Wall, Void Spike, Axiom Bolt. And Reprisal, final blows when surrounded by combatants, give super energy. Then on the Warlock specifically, we have a couple of aspects. Chaos Accelerant gives you the ability to overcharge your grenades. We're quite familiar with that concept already. It is now an aspect with all grenades continuing to have the same effect that they had, now including Magnetic Grenade, which is new to Warlocks. Suppression Grenade, Void Wall, and Void Spike are not listed here though, so their fates are unknown at the moment. Uh, maybe you can't overcharge them at all. Maybe this list scrolls down and we just didn't see it scroll or something. I don't really know. The other one is Child of the Old Gods, which is something sort of new to the class. Casting a Rift creates a Void Soul, similar to the Arc Soul concept from Stormcaller. When you damage something, the soul flies out to the target and it drains them, dealing damage and weakening them. While they're being drained, you get grenade and melee energy if you're on healing rift, or health if you're on empowering rift. If you kill something being drained, you get class ability energy. That all seems pretty good, seems pretty fun, and I'm sure there's going to be plenty of build potential with this in mind. Warlocks also have a new melee attack, but I don't know if this melee attack is replacing the old one or if it is in addition to the old one. The Titan Aspect Bastion is where you slam your shield into the ground, which gives your team an overshield and plants a Rally Barricade. This just seems like a beefed up version of Rally Barricade. Nothing is known regarding Towering Barricade, if it does anything for Towering Barricade. My guess is that it would, but we don't actually know for certain. We also get a tease at something for the Hunter, where it literally looks like a diving attack with a smoke grenade in their hand that makes people invisible if they were near you when you land, on top of a Titan flinging their shield while not in super. I could see the shield fling replacing your melee attack as a Titan, maybe it's an extra ability, just gonna have to wait and see on that one. As a Titan, I think it's awesome to see the Sentinel Shield finally getting some use outside of the super itself. For something that was so iconic to the class, it was really a shame that we couldn't just, you know, throw the shield at something. In terms of how much of the Void capabilities are going to be open to other classes, like, is everyone going to get invisibility? Is everyone going to get Devour? Stuff like that. Bungie said that while there will be a little bit of crossover, if you want to go invisible a lot, Hunter is still probably going to be what you play. Same for energy siphoning with Warlock or defensive capabilities with Titan. They still want the classes to have their own identity within the Void subfamily. Solar and Arc, as we know, will be coming later in the year. That about wraps up the Vi Doc itself and most of the gameplay that I saw, but before we go, sorry to break some hearts here, but no Vault space increase is coming with Witch Queen. Personally, I think most people's vaults are going to get decimated when we start diving deep into crafting, but right now, I think they said technical limitations are stopping a Vault space increase. There will also be no increases to the stack size of things like prisms or shards, but crafting materials do not take up inventory space. They will live outside of that, so that's good. Hopefully no more losing materials to the Postmaster. And that is everything that I got to learn about the Witch Queen and the Vidoc recap. I have been saying this on stream a lot, but I am pretty in on Witch Queen. I think this is going to be a banger of an expansion, definitely better than Shadowkeep and Beyond Light. I'll be bold, I'm gonna say this will be close to, if not equal, to a Forsaken level or Taken King level experience in terms of quality and how much it will be liked. Bungie is really hitting their stride lately and this is probably the most hopeful I've been for the franchise in the past little while. I really think Bungie has it together and I do think they're really gonna impress. Hopefully that's not too bold of a claim and it ends up panning out. 
I guess we'll we'll see in a couple weeks here. Thank you very much for watching. I will see you next time.